Hey, Pablo. Hey, Matt. Hello. Uh, great to have you both here. I'm very excited to talk about some cool tools that give us a nice internal look inside of our Python apps. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about these tools as well. Yeah, it sounds like you've been working on them for a couple of years, you two, and especially you, Pablo, and um, it's going to be great. So that's that's looking at sort of debugging Python apps and even Python apps that have crashed, which is really, really fantastic. Maybe some profiling as well. well maybe having crashing, crashing apps is not that fantastic, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but debugging them maybe, right. Exactly. I'm so excited my app crashed because I get to use this uh, PyStack tool that you all worked on. Awesome. For a while, I actually was <laughs> because that, that means that I could use it. But let's, let's keep that secret. Well, you need test cases, right? And you need examples. And right. I was about to say exactly that. It's a great way to see if we have any bugs. It's a great chance to try things out. Meta debugging. If you're trying to debug the debugger. Oh, we have yep. done that for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet, yeah. How funny. Awesome. Well, let's just have a, a quick round of introductions uh, from, from you guys and, uh, before we could jump into it. Absolutely. Matt will go first. Uh, sure. I am Matt Wisniewski. I'm a senior software engineer at Bloomberg. I originally joined in 2009, I think, so I've been around for quite a while. Uh, I work on the Python infrastructure team at Bloomberg, so our job is building tools and libraries and maintaining the interpreters for use by other teams at Bloomberg. Right on. Sounds very fun. Pablo? Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm, I'm Pablo Alino, um, apart from working at Bloomberg in exactly the same things as Matt because he's my co-worker. Um, <laughs> I am uh, do a bunch of things in the Python community. So I'm, uh, let me see if I don't miss anything. Uh, so I'm in the Python Steam Council. I think this is my third year. I'm also the release manager of 3.10 and 3.11. Uh, 3.10 is going into security fixes. And today I actually need to do the last one. So that's kind of exciting, I suppose. Um, even you if people have a 3.10 are using... release coming today. Yeah, yes, the three twelve beta one. I think uh, we are also releasing three eleven and three ten. Uh, like three eleven is a bug fix, three ten is a first security release, which means it's source only, and uh, it's my yeah. first security release as well. But I think that makes it easier, hopefully. Yeah, and we'll you were on the podcast before talking about the the actual release of three eleven and that whole process. So if people want right. to go back and and look and and see that in more detail. That was really fun. Right, right. We broke GitHub, uh, so that's a, that's a, that's an exciting time when we released 3.11. Um, so yeah, and uh, I'm also in the Python core team, um, mainly working on uh, the parser and uh, the garbage collector, and therefore breaking black and auto formatters a lot <laughs> with new syntax. Yeah, and excellent. faster C Python. You can't forget faster C Python. Ah, right, right, right. Sorry, and I'm collaborating with the faster C Python team as well. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just see. I always forget something. And as, as far as community stuff goes, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I am a moderator on the Python Discord, too. So if anyone is not a member of Python Discord, they should join. It's a cool place to yeah. hang out. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put that a link to that in the show notes as well so people can check that out. So you all are busy is what I hear you saying. <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, excellent. Well, let's let's maybe set the stage for talking about PyStack here. And the the first thing I want to talk about is just, you know, what, well, hold on. I do want to point out, like you said, you both work on the infrastructure team at right. Bloomberg. I'm not sure people fully appreciate how much Python is happening at Bloomberg. <laughs> so maybe we should just give like a, a big picture because it's germane to this conversation, like PyStack and other tools like Memory, which we may get a chance to talk about if we have time those are coming out of supporting this large community. And I got a right. sense of how big Python is at Bloomberg when there were 60 engineers from Bloomberg <laughs> at PyCon and everybody's booth duty and you know, was measured in minutes. Right, right. And they didn't copy paste the same engineer 60 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite wild. Um, so I can, I can start if, if you want to. Um, 
it's, it's very interesting actually that you point this out because Bloomberg being a very old company, you know, when people talk about legacy and it's like, oh, we, we have legacy because we have this Python 2.7 script. Yeah. Well, just you should see what a company started, that is starting the 70s can do about that. But but it used to be a C++ house. And when I started, yeah. actually, the main, the, the main language were C++ and JavaScript for the front end in Bloomberg Terminal. And now we are actually, I, I think I'm... If I'm not mistaken, Matt uh, can correct me, but I think we are we can say proudly that now we are a Python house because I think we just surpassed for the first time the amount of p lines of Python compared with C++. And if, if that is not true, it's mostly, it's mostly there, um, which is quite exciting. At the, at the point where I joined the company, we uh, had onboarding training for juniors that included a uh, Fortran for C programmers section. And at this point, we have a C++ for Python programmers section instead. So that's how much it's wow. changed over the last decade right. or so. Wow. I think that's the mean that C++ is now legacy. <laughs> Who we'll uh, oh. we'll said oh. that? Uh, so they know me. Uh, the Steam Council member says that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, so yeah, um, but this is an interesting, and this kind of goes into the tool itself. I think this is an interesting, um, you know, scenario because that C++ didn't went away. Like, um, among other things, is because it is not legacy, or, you know, like Python is not the fastest language on the planet, although we are trying to make it fast, but certainly not, no, we are not trying to make it compete with C++. Uh, so that C++ is both there and, and needed because you know that you cannot just do everything in Python for sure. Uh, so the situation that we have at Bloomberg, uh, which is served by many other big companies uh, and, and finance companies as well, is that we have a lot of C++ under that Python. So so the and uh, well, C++ by itself, but let's talk about the actual part that is interesting for Python. So so you can write a lot of pure Python scripts, right? But um, what most people are the, or company does is that it writes some Python and 99% of the all the time, it ends reaching some C++ underneath. And this is not just because they are using NumPy or Pandas or any of these compiled very common scenarios as well, but also because they are using Bloomberg code underneath, which is, just happens to be written in C++. And, um, and, and this means that, you know, now we have a huge community of people that are need to be aware of both languages at the same time. So you have Python programmers that need to be aware of C++ as well as C++ programmers that need to be aware of Python. Um, either because they just happen to switch to Python or because they use Python to run tests or, or things like that. So it's a very interesting scenario. Yeah, and I imagine you know, leading up to this conversation, if something goes wrong, right, you might not be entirely sure. Is it the Python code? Is it the C++ code? Is it the interaction of these things? <laughs> right, that can yeah. make it tricky. And this is quite uh, what you point out is basically what among other things one of the things that make make us work on this in the first place because what happened normally is that when an application one of these applications that is hybrid grass at Bloomberg we used to have this many companies does this I mean I would assume all of them but uh, what happened is that when an application crashes we either get a core file um, right which is this kind of like file that is dumped by the kernel with all the memory dump of the of the process and a bunch of information and you can analyze it later uh, or uh, a debugger basically attaches to the process and shows you the back trace. but the problem is that this debugger was gdb which means that the back trace that you get is a c uh, back trace it's not a python back trace right and the back trace is useless for everyone. So it's like, it doesn't matter if you're a C++ programmer or you're a Python programmer, it's always useless. It's useless for Python programmers because you see uh, C functions and like a Python programmer normally is like, what is this? Like, what is that register, right? But like, uh, on the other hand, it's also useless for C++ programmers because the function that evaluates Python code, which is called pi eval eval frame default is repeated 600 times. And it doesn't make any sense. They, they not only they also expect to see their uh, Python code, but now their C++ code is just buried among these mysterious calls. So nobody could make sense of what's going on. Uh, which means that uh, when a for a long time, when a Python application crashed at Bloomberg, I mean we're talking crash here as like hard crash, like sec fault, right. right? Which is common in C++ sec faults, or sometimes even Python can sec fault, right? Uh, in some situations. So so obviously a Python exception is reported as a Python exception. We are not talking that our system picked GDB. If, if a Python exception is raised, obviously that is fine. It's when this kind of like hybrid setup crashes in, in very deeply, either because Python crashes or because NumPy crashes or because the Bloomberg code crashes. So in those cases, nobody could make sense of what's going on because you know the the 
the back tracing is useless by itself. And, right. and not just I, crashes. Right. I, I'd, I'd add that um, that it's also a problem for deadlocks as well. Um, one of the big differences between uh, Python and C++, they have, they've got very different models for how they represent the lifetimes of objects and things like that. You can very easily get into a situation where um, like a, a C++ object is trying to, a C++ object that is owned by a Python object in our hybrid work environment is trying to uh, communicate with a background thread to, I don't know, tell it to stop or something like that. But that background thread winds up needing to pick up the gill for some reason. And if you have the foreground thread still holding the gill, you've just introduced a deadlock. And it's very difficult to track that down if the only tool at your disposal is GDB and you can't easily see what Python stuff is being called. Right, sorry. Yeah, and Python, oh, sorry, C++ multi-threading is like critical sections and locks and like it's really explicit. You, right. you, you know, enter a lock, you exit a lock and, you know, Python has that as well. But in addition, it just has this implicit gill that you're talking about, right? And that that throws a whole nother layer of potential deadlocks in there that I imagine is that's pretty tricky. Uh, and some of them are not only difficult to spot, but it's very difficult to reason about just because most of these things are implicit. So difficult, actually, that even if you go to some popular tools in the wild, they don't handle all the edge cases because it's quite, it's quite hardcore. Like the, the fact that you can just request the gil in the middle of, like for instance, we are not going, I don't know if we will end talking about memory profilers here, but um, most memory profilers that are measuring uh, like native allocations in Python and C++, they need to see the Python stack somehow. Like when, when an allocation is made, you say, oh, give me some memory. You need to say, who called this function? And then you need to see both the C sometimes, or you only care about Python, you just need to say, okay, what is the Python stack trace, right? Like an exception, but like who called this function? And for that, you need the gil. So you need to say, give me the gil, and then I will print the stack. But like sometimes, in one of the situations that Matt is describing, will introduce a deadlock. Uh, it's very, very rare situations, but the, it's, it's the kind of situations that will involve threads and like, you know, specific things, but, but um, which means that it will happen very, very rarely, but it will happen or it can happen. So it's both going to be rare to the bag because, you know, this person who is going to appear when, you know, when the moon is high and, you know, Wednesday is, uh, <laughs> is going to stay well, only in these cases, the deck looks. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to fix as well because now you cannot just have the gill, so you need a, a complete redesign sometimes. Um, so it, it can be very challenging to fix, to find, and to the bug as well. Yeah. Those situations are so tricky. You know that they often get the the term Heisen bugs to indicate oh, right, kind of right. the, the quantum mechanical uncertainty, right? Like. It could be in some state, but if you measure it, then it's in a different state, right? It's kind of it, how do you actually track these down? And they happen in uh, a lot of times in production, but only under heavy load after like 12 hours. So how do you use normal debugging techniques to step through that? All these things are really, really tricky. But it sounds like also, yeah, right. they are very also interesting as well. We can certainly discuss exactly what you just said because it's, it's spot on. And one of the reasons here is that, as you, as you mentioned, uh, the moment you touch a debugger, because the debugging process normally slows down the code, means that reproducing the deadlock may be harder. So yeah. sometimes the only way to properly debug this thing is, is, is letting it crash without the debugger, producing a core file, and then analyzing the core file. But because the core file is dead, I mean, it's just basically a dump, you cannot call functions now, uh, then GDP can be useless if you don't know how to use like certain tools. So PyStack actually is very useful here as well because you can kind of reproduce the deadlock at full speed, um, let, generate it in a core or letting it crash, and then use PyStack. Uh, but we can we can talk about that later. Or again. maybe you don't know that you're trying to reproduce a deadlock and right, it right, just happens, right? Well, right? And you're like, you know, um, it it won't respond, but the the CPU load on the server is zero. That right. <laughs> Right. Sorry. Yeah, that's oh. sort of, is it waiting for something or is it ever going to respond or you just don't know what it's doing yet? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, logging will help a little bit, but not, you got to have some pretty intense logging to get that right. level of uh, what's going yeah. on. And usually that, you don't want that in production either. All right. So let's start our conversation about just the, the spectrum of what the options are out there. Hello. Now, 
you mentioned yep. um, GDB, but I, I guess on one side of the, the spectrum, we have PyCharm and VS Code and Friends where you press F5 or you press the little debug thing and you step through your code. And that's helpful when you're actually developing your application. But, but you're talking about running in production or running applications or applications that have crashed and here's a, a core file. Uh, those... Right. Those are not exactly the same situation, are they? Right. So we are this. We are talking about the specific case. We are we are sending ourselves in two main scenarios. Although you can certainly use it in others, but the, just just to have a good mental model over what these tools are going to be useful for and what are they different from PDB or VS Code divide, right? We are talking about things that crash and crash are like hard crash, like you know, or things that are frozen. It could be a deadlock, but it could be also that your application is waiting for something and it never arrives, and you want to know what what is going on. And and specifically, when when these tools are going to become even more useful, or is when this code involves C plus plus or C code or Rust code for what I mean. So so some native code, right? And the reason this is going to be more useful is because PDB or VS Code debugger or PyCharm normally attach Python debuggers, which means that these debuggers only know about the Python world. And that normally is insufficient uh, because you want to see both worlds at the same time. And this is going to become very critical. You don't want to be one world and the other separately. You want some tool that understands both worlds at the same time and can show you what, what really is happening and how this works. Like you're entering one world, leaving it, but then you're entering again or something like that. So right. that, so that is what we are. Code, uh, you know, a, a Python profiler won't. They won't see the right. steps happening so, so for instance, that, right? At Bloomberg, a Python profiler will tell you that the application, if, if it's, let's say, it's frozen, and then you say you, you use VS Code, it's, it's going to tell you that it's, it's frozen on run, a function called run. And then there's 600 layers of C++ underneath, which ones you don't know. <laughs> or like, for instance, if you say, let's say for mysterious reasons, that uh, NumPy has a bug or something, right? And then you're adding two NumPy arrays, and it's telling you that the addition of the NumPy arrays is... is what is being frozen, but you don't know what what is happening underneath. And then with uh, you know you want to see what's happening on the NumPy C++ code, uh, or yeah. the SciPy code, or the TensorFlow code, or like, you know there is countless examples of like heavy C++ or or, or compile code underneath. Like for instance, Pydantic these days is running on Rust, which yeah. means that if something goes wrong there. Or, or it just crashes or is freezing or whatever, you're going to not see it either, right? So, so, so those we are talking about those cases, right? We've, um, um, we've we've seen deadlocks on the on the GC Dell of a object that's defined in an extension module, and when that happens, all the Python debugger is going to tell you is absolutely nothing. It it doesn't see the call into the TP Dell method. It doesn't see. Yeah. Uh, it, it, all it shows you is that there is a variable that's going out of scope or being reassigned or something like that um, on the last Python line that was run, and anything happening under that is just totally opaque to it. Right. On the other hand, just just talking about the other tools. So on the other hand, things like GDB uh, have the same problem that we're talking about. GDB only understands C code. So what it's going to show you is that yes, your interpreter is going to show you the, the kind of NumPy code underneath or the C++ code underneath or the Rust code underneath. But it's not going to show you the Python code, so you don't know what will call that. So this is the right. other side of the coin. You're going There's to see a lot like. Of C that C action happening. But how I reach this C, we don't know. And the situation when this is really bad is when you kind of enter and exit the C realm multiple times, right? So you have some Python code that calls some C code, and internals call some Python code again, and some C code again. So, so that is kind of really hard because you're going to not see anything. Like it's impossible because you don't know how you reach this situation. Um, and, and that's quite hard. So, so the, all, like the classic debuggers, um, won't be able to to do so. Interestingly, though, because we are going to see that there is some other tools that have some functionality close to what uh, PyStack it does. So in Python, in C Python, we provide some some um, like plugins. Let's call it. This is basically a, an extension files that you can kind of add to GDB that allows you to do some similar things. So for instance, um, the, the Python files that you can put in uh, in GDB allow you to pretty print Python objects. So even if you're in the C world, you can kind of print some objects. And you can also print like some kind of like Python stack tree. So you can ask like, hey, can you kind of show me what I'm in Python? But it's not a hybrid one. So it will only show you where you are in Python, which means that you're going to miss the C version. 
because this GDB, you can also ask for the C version, but you're not going to see them together. You're going to see either one or the other. Right. And then it's up to you how to kind of like, like merge them, <laughs> uh, which sometimes is very hard because there's very hard rules to know how to do that, especially for instance in Python 3.11, and some of the optimizations we did in the Python 3, uh, in, the, in the Fasters in Python project means that the same evaluator loop can be reused for multiple Python functions. So you, you some, in 3.11, you are not even able to do it without extra metadata. Um, so, so, so it's quite hard. And, and even if these, uh, the, let's say, uh, plugins are actually useful and can get you closer, and for a lot of time that was useful and the only way to do that, Specific, if it's specific for core files, because if you have a core file, your only option is using GDB or was on before bias type. Sure. Uh, you, you could somehow do it. The problem is that uh, GDB relies on, um, to do this, relies on debugging information inside the core, which means that if you have Python interpreters that don't have debug information, which by the way is most, all, most Python uh, uh, interpreters that are shipping distributions, um, or most Python interpreters that I use normally because you don't want to ship gigantic debugging information to production most of the time because this can get really big. Means that GDB yeah. is not going to work because it relies on the fact that they can inspect uh, local C variables inside the frames. And as many you know, C programmers will tell you is the most common thing that GDB will tell you is optimized expression, which means that I cannot tell you anything here, <laughs> uh, which means that it's not going to work. Um, there is ways to make it work, but you know we are entering the expert realm here. Like you know, uh, making GDB kind of work here is the kind of like you know you need two staff engineers and like or, or a C Python core dev that knows what is going on. So so that's certainly not for for your average Python program, right? Which is, yeah. it, let's remember we are trying to debug something, which probably we are under pressure and we don't want to read the you know the man page of. GDB and Python and how to debug Python with GDP and like debugging what what, what is debugging information. So you know if you're a Python programmer and, and just want to like you know paste a stack trace in a back report for instance because someone asked you to do that or you just want to see what's going on or you just want to tell someone where it's crashing. You don't want to learn all of these things. Like you don't even have time. Maybe it's, you know you need to fix it. It's crashing on production, right? So you can, you cannot just tell those, your boss. Oh yes, wait here until I read the man page of GDB, right? Like it's not going to happen. I, yeah, I don't know how many people. I imagine a, a good number, but not all of the people listening have had an application or an API or something crashing in production when people are trying to get to it. It's very stressful, right? <laughs> I, I should add that uh, distributions do generally give you a way to get at the debug data for an interpreter. It's not as though they strip it off entirely and it's gone forever. It's just okay. that the way that you get at it after the fact is uh, different per distribution, and it's not something that necessarily everyone who's firing up GDB knows how to do. So it's not that it's gone forever. It's just that it's not easily accessible to everyone, I'd say. Right. Sure. And sometimes do, it doesn't do even... you add it afterwards? Like if my do... app crashes and I'm like, oh, no, I didn't have the debug information. You can actually, uh, it'll either be like on Ubuntu, it'll be a Python 3 dash debug package that you install, or um, there's also a thing called debug info D that can download the debug information from servers managed by your distribution as needed when a debugger requests it, which is pretty cool. But the problem is that this still doesn't assure you that GDB is going to work. It's just that it gives you more chances. But still, if your uh, Python interpreter is heavily yeah. optimized, this may be not enough. And actually, for the for, yeah. for the sake of giving data, in most distributions, it's actually not enough. Because these, these variables, particularly the frame variable in the Python evaluator loop, is extremely heavily optimized, among other things, because it has to be. Because yeah. the Python evaluator loop is very hot path. So, so some, most of the time, these, these tools are, let's say, unreliable. Um, yeah. So yeah. The the um, let's introduce kind of like what Pystack does then, and then let's let's talk about also like what other tools you can use that are not Pystack maybe. But yeah, um, sure. Let. So I think that's probably a good setup for Pystack. Like, why why does it exist? Why do people really? Like, why is it such a game changer? Right. It's right. It it understands both of these worlds in a really nice way. Tell us about is it. Exactly. So the short version, because uh, and this is quite funny, because like when we were at PyCon, we were presenting both projects that we maintain here: PyStack and Memory. And Memory, everybody knew, but PyStack was the new one. 
<laughs> and, and a lot of people didn't kind of catch exactly what the, what it does, and it's actually easier to explain than the profiler, uh, which I think it, you know is quite funny that that was the other way. So the PyStack, the, what it does is very simple. So PyStack is a tool when you give it a Python program that is running or frozen, right? but let's say it's alive, or a core file, and it will tell you what it's doing. So it will give you the stack trace, basically. So it's going to tell you, OK, so this, this Python program has these many threads. And for every thread, it's going to show you the stack trace, right? Like, So this function is calling this function, is calling this function, and it's running currently Like, like a snapshot in time, right? When right. you asked it, it's like, boom, what are all the threads doing? Here exactly. So if the okay. program is running, which you can absolutely run PyStack on a healthy running program, it's going to tell you what was doing at that time. So by default, it's going to stop the program for a super small amount of uh, time is going to take a photo of what, what the program is doing and it's going to tell you what every thread was doing so who calls who and what the program was actually running at that time if the program is frozen because you have a log or something like that it's going to um, show you what is blocked basically and if you have a core file because your program crashed or because you generate one by, on demand because by the way you can absolutely generate one core on demand just take a snapshot and it's there it will tell you what the program was doing when the core was generated and this That's is the cherry. You can do it in Linux just on the in the terminal. You can just say take a core dump of some running process. Yeah. For instance, you okay. can do it with GDB or with a utility that sells out to GDB called GCore. Um, okay. which is installed by default when you install GDB. And the cherry on the top here is that it will tell you both what the Python code and the C code. Uh, so it will tell you like Okay, so we are calling these Python functions, you know, main and main calls, you know, create dictionary and uh, create dictionary calls and add, add NumPy array. And but then when it enters C code, the C realm is going to show you also the C calls. Um, and then when, if it enters Python again, it's going to show you Python again and C again. And it's going to tell you if it's Python or C. And also it's going to show you uh, the code that is running. So it's, if the, the source code is available, which most time it is, it's going to show you like exactly what line, like the same thing as a traceback. Basically it's going to show you like what, what line was running. And very cool as well, since Python 3.11, it's going to show you the what sub-expression is running. Because in Python 3.11, uh, we have this, um, better error project that I started, uh, mm -hmm. and now we have line, uh, sorry, column information. So we know if you have a very complicated expression and something crashes, we can point you exactly to what part of the expression was generating the crash. But now we can use the same information in this tool to show you what part of the expression was running. So, for instance, you were yeah. adding four numpy arrays, uh, and the application is crashes adding the second and the third one, we can show you, okay, it's, it's crashing adding the second and the third one. So you can know exactly um, that was that, that operation and not the other one, uh, which is quite cool. And the same for C. It sounds awesome. And I also like the description here. PyStack is a tool that uses forbidden magic to let you <laughs> inspect the stack frames of a process. I got a, as a, as a funny uh, trivia. I got a, I got a funny conversation with Mark Shannon. Uh, we we are uh, we work together on the five star Python project because we say here uh, nasty C Python internals, <laughs> which mostly <laughs> you know like so we went into what is a nasty C Python internal because we both do those nasty C Python internals. But you know I think it's nobody really enjoys uh, internal C Python, not even core devs. So there you go. <laughs> well, and I imagine that you're making your life harder with three eleven, all of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm. This is kind of weird because I'm making my own job harder every single time. So I work on Python. I'm happy, and then I'm sad because I just make my own life harder <laughs> on the other side of the pool, right? This is a project that would be much, much harder to maintain if Pablo wasn't around to help on it. Because yeah, it, in order to keep this forbidden magic working, we do need to keep up with changes to the interpreter. And it's a place where if we didn't have core devs telling us what changed in the interpreter, it would be very hard to, to keep up with those changes and figure yeah. out just what has changed. Especially since the faster CPython stuff has kicked into gear. Right. Well, one thing here, which is also quite interesting, is that we are not the only people to enjoy this forbidden magic. We have a Cohen, let's say. Um, this is this forbidden magic is shared in one way or the other with uh, um, performance providers. So, for instance, some of the ones that use similar techniques are uh, Austin, Austin, uh, the Austin provider, and also PySpy. Um, and it's quite interesting because the, the, there is a different, uh, like both both tools can actually do something similar. So both PyStack and Austin can kind of take a snapshot and, and show you what the application is doing. 
Um, at the time of uh, this podcast, they can do it for a live process. They cannot do it for a core file. Um, yeah. Okay. So if you have a core file, you are out of luck. You can only use PyStack. If you have a live, a live process, you can use PyStack, but you can also use PySpy or Austin. Both both can uh, do that. The main difference here, uh, even if we share functionality, is that we are not a profiler. We are a debugger, which means that we we try really, really hard to find that information, even in the most weird situations. So for instance, even if you have corrupted memory or your file or your core file is corrupted or your process is, is really, really in a bad state, uh, we can still give you the information, even if you don't have the back symbols. Uh, or So, so we, we are slower than both profilers because uh, both PySpy and Austin need to basically take photos at a very high speed because that's what the profiler does. It basically takes a lot of photos very fast and then he's going to show you, okay, I took like 1 million photos in a second and most of the time you, the photos show that you were in this function called very slow function. So, so that is going to tell you, well, you're spending most of your time in this function, you should optimize that function. So for them, it's really, really important to take those photos really fast, right? Sometimes even sacrificing correctness in some cases. Yeah, uh, they have some option, profilers right. especially, yeah. Right, they have some options to control the correctness because they need to kind of sometimes guess. And sometimes these photos they take um, with the process, the process running. So, you know, you can be like half of the photo in one place and half of the other in the other. And both have like options to control if you want that or not. But it's the like idea here, in video games. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I, I always think about that particular uh, metaphor when I explain this. Um, but most people don't know what that is, so I'm very, I'm very happy to know that you're a, you're a connoisseur as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, but like the the main difference is that for them, the the they do a very good work. Just to be clear here, but for them, their their main concern is the speed, right? And the whole thing is, is is surrounded by this idea of doing this operation very fast. And because they do it very fast, they can do it once. So you just ask for one photo, they can give you that photo. In our case, our Concern is not the speed because we are not a profiler. Our concern is correctness and the photo. So we really, really, really hard try to get the correct photo and the photo if, if it's possible. Um, so that's kind of the main difference. This means that if yeah. you are, you know, already using a lot of people are using PySpy, for instance, for this kind of my Python application is frozen. So in that case, you don't care if the photo is fast or slow because it's already frozen. Like who cares, right? But on the other hand, if you have a crashing application, especially a core file, then you're kind of out of luck because these, pro these projects don't work at the time that we are speaking for core yeah. files. Yeah, PyStack um, really seems to have a unique feature set, a special right. place in the ecosystem, yeah. And and most of the kind of extra features that PyStack has, which are not the main functionality, are like, sure, like uh, are basically around this idea of we are a debugger. So for instance, we can give you extra metadata, um, like, you know, some of this metadata actually also is shared with these tools, but some other is not. So we give you things like uh, which thread has the guild at the time, or like if the GC is running on the thread or not. Uh, we also tell you like, like the column offsets and things like that. Um, so, so there is a lot of like uh, extra stuff that we can provide to you, so you can uh, debug easily, more easily your um, your your applications. For instance, for the C code, we if it's available, which is, means that for uh, we can give you the column offsets as well of the source code that generated the the binaries. Uh, you need a modern compiler for to, to do that. Like only Dwarf four, I think, has this information. Dwarf is the debugging format for C, um, which is kind of funny because the binary format is ELF. So, you know, it's ELF and Dwarf. <laughs> ELF, ELF stands for executable and linkable format. Uh, but Dwarf doesn't, it's a, it doesn't, have a, doesn't have an acronym. It's just, it's just funny. Um, well, they have they, they come with this weird backronym, I think they call it, when you come with acronym after the fact. So you just say, yeah. oh, Dwarf is very funny. Let's, let's try to put it. And I think they, they now it stands on debugging with arbitrary format or something like it's just it's really bad that's in it's not, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it's, fit the, the acronym into right, the, right. the thing yeah yeah right but, but well, the the idea is the that, service and we'll see where it goes from there <laughs> exactly yeah literally so the idea is that we give you this extra kind of metadata around it um and, and every time we do this we, we try to do more for instance we are now talking about um with 312 uh, we are going to release in Python um, sub interpreters. So we are discussing the possibility of showing sub interpreters also in PyStack or maybe a sync IO task. I mean, these are not actual features that we are running right now, but the idea is that we are considering these things uh, that for a profiler maybe it's just too hard because it means right. that you need to inspect a lot more memory 
and your photo is going to be pro pro prohibitively slow. Uh, but for us, it's not because we just take one photo and it just needs to be a very good one. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, see, you are making your life harder over and over. A uh, quick question from the audience in the live stream. Tony says, could this be utilized in something like AWS Lambda as error handling? Grab the core dump if it bombs, since you wouldn't have access to the runtime after the Lambda executed. Yeah, I mean, um, I wouldn't, it's not the, I like, I, I, as a as a compiler engineer, I would say, I, I don't know anything about AWS. <laughs> so I don't know if it's the best, <laughs> if the best uh, way to do it, but yeah, absolutely. This is something that you can do. If you generate a core file, then Pysta can absolutely handle your core file. No problem. Yeah, I think the only, I think the only question I have there is if you can get the core file out after it has crashed, but as long as there's some way to get the core file out, you definitely could inspect it with Pystack. Oh, interesting. Is there a, a, a Python code level API for working with PyStack, or is it an outside only thing? No, at the time, it's just a command line application. Uh, gotcha. we, okay. could, we could expose it. Like, PyStack is only a library with a lot of like functionality. So, if there is people that want to use it for other things, we are quite happy to expose it. Um, yeah, I'm thinking things hard like um, for, say, um, C C profile, you can you know turn off the profiling at startup and then turn it back on with Python code, or or you could set like an at exit callback potentially to like um so those, we we, kind of things. we we don't have this, but we do have uh, some other cool thing that I mean. Let's say it intersects twenty percent to what you said. Just to be clear, I'm not trying to answer your question fully, but but I think it's sure. related. We have this Python plugin. Uh, mm -hmm. Which basically you can install, and if some of your test crashes, it's going to just run PyStack, or crashes or freezes. Uh, it's going to run PyStack on that, and it's going to show you what happened. And we are talking also to have something similar to Fault Handler, uh, which is a standard library module that you can activate. And if your process crashes, it shows you the Python stack, but again, you're missing the C stack. So, so we are going to allow you to also have this idea of like, oh, I want to just you know run my Python application. And if it crashes, then I want PyStack to be run on the process so I can see um, what was the, happening there. By the way, this literally is something that was used. Uh, for instance, um, URLib3, the, uh, the project URLib3, I think is the most downloaded package on PyPI or is close to be. Um, I think so. Yeah, so so they use memory, which is our memory profiler, and sometimes uh, in you know again when the moon was full on Wednesdays, it was crashing on some weird test, um, and uh, you know at the time we asked them, well you know memory uses C plus plus code underneath, no surprise there, and you are using Python code that uses memory, so the crash is happening in some combination of both, and we needed both the stacks to debug what was going on. And uh, I thought, man, if only we have PyStack open source, <laughs> we could just <laughs> tell them, like, run this thing on your test suite. But at the time, we didn't have it. So so we have to, like, ask them for a core file. They, they, they tried. But, like, so at the end, we ended having to try to reproduce it on our side, which was really hard because this was a race condition, basically. Um, and, uh, and the race, so, so I did all the weird techniques, like running a... Uh, a Docker container with 0.001 CPU quota, and like running hundreds of uh, test suites at the same time. It was not a fun afternoon, let's say. Um, if I recall correctly, that took us like a full 24 hours to reproduce just running the tests in a loop until we managed to catch it the first time. Wow. If you run into my into my room at the time, you see this this meme when there's this guy with the blackboard with a lot of threads, like like running, moving their hands like super crazy, like uh, so that that was me at the time running like six like six uh, T max splits uh, with the test suite running. So yeah, this tool is when it, when when you need it, it's really use, useful. Um, yeah, so, so if it's you the have kind of thing that a lot of times you don't need. Ah, oh, it's interesting. And then when right. you do need it. Amazing, and, yeah. and this is key because what happens normally with debugging tools, like GTV is a very good example of this, is that they are very hard to use. Like the 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 kind of like amount of knowledge that you need is quite high. They are not very ergonomic, which means that you know it's not the easiest thing. You need to get used to them and their language and what they can do and what cannot do and like you know. So it's the kind of thing that you normally people learn when they need to. Which is the worst time to learn it because you need to solve the problem, not learn how to use it, and it's very, it's very annoying. 
Um, so where we are trying to do quite a lot, uh, both on PyStack, but also on, on our, our memory profiler memory, is to offer a really good UX uh, around these tools. So that's where we are offering this the PyTest plugin and thinking about doing this 400 thing. Um, to, because it's not just like, you know, the tool itself that you can execute, but also like you, we want you to not have to think about it. So you, you don't, it's not the tool to reach, it's the tool that is backing you up. So, so you, you set it once, you forget about the fact that it exists, and uh, when something happens, you are really happy that you set that thing up. Um, and that's the experience that we want people. That uh, And this is the other kind of extra thing that we are trying to put into Biostack, that, that the UX is really good. So, so you know, like, Matt, I yeah, think you want to do and as far as the UX goes, I, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that when people are using these tools, it's almost certainly not because they want to. Like, no one is having a good time when they're using these tools. They're using these tools because something has already gone wrong and stopped them from doing what they wanted to be doing in the first place. And yeah. now they need to, to backtrack and figure out why. You're kind of like an emergency room doctor. People don't ever want to meet the emergency room doctor, but they're happy they're there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's the key. Yeah. Matt, I noticed looking at the GitHub repo for PyStack that there's a lot of languages involved here. We got a good chunk of Python, C++, Cython, C, only a little bit of C, I guess. But you both have to keep a lot of technology interplay in mind just working on this, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, my career has been as a C++ developer mostly, so uh, it tends to surprise people when we tell them that on the a Python infrastructure team, we spend most of our time working on C++ and relatively little time writing Python, comparatively little. Like If you actually looked at the, the way this code breaks down in the PyStack repo, you would see that even though it's predominantly Python code, the Python code is predominantly in the test suite. Um, most of okay. the actual code for, Python, uh, for PyStack is in, uh, is in C++ or in Cython, not in Python. I was right. going to guess that Python might be in there like reporting, CLI parsing. Literally is, is what it is, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're exactly right. And then is there in some parts when really C++ will be overkill or too verbose or too annoying? Like, I think parsing some stuff, I think, is is, is that, like preparing the input to the C++ code, let's say. Um, yeah. yeah, parsing part that, maps or things like that. Right. So, that, But that's the other thing. Like, one of the reasons there is so much C++ up, actually, is not only because of performance, but because these tools need to play quite heavily on systems programming techniques. So, so PyStack plays a lot of, let's say, quote-unquote, dark magic. Uh, it's not as dark as our other tool, the profiler, because the profiler is just in another level of darkness that has, that has like, gone through many, you know, <laughs> many dark rituals already. But here as well, because, like, at the end of the day, what, what these tools do, uh, what PyStack does is that it's reading um, memory from a different program, right? And that is quite complicated because when you read memory for a different program, there is nothing. It's just bytes. Here's some bytes, yeah. and then you need to yeah. figure it out what, what they are. And most of the time, uh, the bytes that you're reading are, are not backed by anything that you can use to make sense of. Because, you know, for instance, GDB, when it reads those bytes, it has the debugging information. So it knows that, oh, I'm reading bytes at this address, but these this bytes means like, oh, a uh, byte interpreter state struct. So I know that, you know, the first eight bytes are this and that, and I know where to locate things. Uh, we do that in, if this is available because we don't want to make our, har our lives harder just for no reason, but because we have to support the cases when that information is not there, we employ these, these, these extra techniques that are trying to make sense of those bytes without knowing what they are. So there is like a bunch of heuristics and checks the heuristics. And this can get like quite hardcore because like I think at some point we had like four levels of, of checks just because of one heuristic, you know, the kind of thing when you say, well, there is no way in the world if these things are true is not what I'm searching for. Well, I will tell you, yes, that, that it will happen. We have seen those when like, I, I, I remember that we were having this yeah. discussion. We have four checks for something. Basically, to we are reading some bytes and we are making sense of some pointers. And if some, a bunch of conditions are true, we are sure that we have located some important piece of information, the interpreter state, I think, or the thread state, whatever it is. And I, 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 Matt was saying, well, but, you know, there is this case when these things can be true and it's still not it because, you know, it just happens to have these properties. And I said, okay, let me calculate mathematically the probability of that happening. And it was 0.001%, right? And then we said, yeah. cool, never happening. I think it was three months until it happened. So, so you know, like, 
yes, it, you, you, we, we need to take care of a lot of, uh, of of these things to ensure that. A lot of edge cases. Um, I'm starting to understand the black magic right, reference right. here. So, so that's part of it. The other part is, is just like all the shenanigans with like, you know, stopping the process, making sense of CPython, trying to extract information from CPython in, in ways that CPython is not prepared to. Um, so you need to know a lot about everything, a lot about systems programming, so how to read memory from processes, how to stop processes. And also these tools, uh, this is quite important to mention as well, these tools um, are supposed to GDB because when you attach GDB to a project, uh, GDB can do whatever you want. It can either inject code into the process, it can call things in the process. So it's m many uh, teams have GDB forbidden in production because GDB, attaching GDB can do arbitrary things, right? So you don't want that so a lot of the time, especially if you are under compliance or, or you have like secrets. Right, support. right. If you're in a banking industry, say, or something like that, and right. You try to catch a problem and it changes, <laughs> it right. makes decisions that might not be awesome. And GDB can make your application crash, like you can absolutely do that because it can inject code. And it's like you see, like I, I invite everyone interested on, right? Try to learn how GDB calls functions in your, pro in your process. So you attach GDB, you can call a function in the process, just learn how that is done, and you're going to, you're going to cry. Um, and if you want to cry even more because you say, well, man, I still have some tears in my eyes and like, it's not enough, just learn how, how LLDB does it. Like this is the other debugger like from, from LLVM because that is just bananas. That is just another level of craziness. So these tools are very powerful, but are also a bit dangerous. So the other thing that we really, really put a lot of effort in is that these tools just read memory. That they don't modify the process at all. The only thing they do is stop it, which is always a safe operation. And then they restart, they restart the process. That's all. And you can also choose not to stop it if you don't want to. Because, for instance, you have some super performance uh, applications. So PyStack can still take snapshots with the process running if you really need to, sacrificing obviously that the photo may be a bit blurry, let's say. Most of yep. the time it will be, but like it can be. Uh, but you can also ask for that. But the idea is that these are safe to use on running processes because we don't touch uh, the memory at all. We just read it. I yeah. will say, you say that stopping a process is always safe. That's not necessarily true. It does change the behavior of syscalls that are uh, in the middle of happening. They'll, they'll get a... Uh, uh, An e, um, they, they get an e, e, uh, e enter. E, e enter. E enter. Yeah. yeah, they'll get an e-enter, and that can change the behavior of the program. What's supposed to happen is that the program detects that the syscall has been interrupted and retries it, but not all of them do that all the time, because at C and your error handling is all manual, it's very easy to miss a place where you needed to retry something. So. Well, C++ does it, so, so it's kind of, unless you have like your custom code most of the time, it's safe to do. That's true. But this can happen also if you send signals to your process. So for instance, you have a any process and then it just happens to send a signal or someone interrupts the process like for instance because you have it under a scheduler or, or you're using some very old kernel for instance that sends uh six stop um or you're running it in a cluster when when you can put in the freeze uh, um uh, c group uh you, you you will get the same situation and you will see for instance you see python all the time this loop that just checks if the for instance you're reading bytes and then your read call finishes and then you normally assume, well, it has finished because I have read all the bytes that I wanted. Well, it may be not true because you may have been interrupted. So you need to try again. Um, sure. And at a higher level, it could be I was calling an API and it did pause and that actually caused it to time out right. or something like that, right? Or a database connection reset right. or, or something weird at that level. But I think a big difference here is these are a single call went crazy while you paused it whereas when you talk about injecting code you could have messed it up for the rest of the life of the process oh, yeah, yeah in, in unknown right? ways yeah absolutely yeah, like technically exactly. attaching gdb is undefined behavior because you can modify a return memory in ways that you don't know what's going on obviously it's not going to be that the case because gdb doesn't do that by default but but just calling, calling functions can alter like especially if you're going to see api if you just happen to have a pointer and then you want to print the pointer and you call by dump uh, object, uh, it, now you are like, who knows what happened? You, you are just calling, you, you need the guild, for instance, to do that. So it's, like, it's very it's very unclear what's going on. So we don't do I mean, any of that. 
even in cases where you're able to successfully call a function with GDB, it manages to get its stub injected and do everything that it needs to do to set up the call. You can wind up in a situation where you don't satisfy some of the invariants for that call, and that call winds up segfaulting in code injected by GDB. And it tries to recover from that, but it can't always. So you can very yeah. easily get yourself in a situation where you thought you were doing something read-only and manage to crash the process that you were trying to inspect. You, you can see that we, we learned this the hard way for our other tool because the one, one, one thing our memory profiler does, um, this is memory, no, so not PyStack, this is the other tool. Uh, so the other tool allows you to attach to a process, right? To, you, you have a process that is happily running, and then you say, now I want to profile this process that is already running. So I just want to know, every time it makes allocations, I just want to know that it's happening, or you just want to see it live. And so what we do is that we, in that case, we inject memory into the process to just prepare the profiler and all do all the stuff, which, and then we learn the hard way, all the cases when you cannot do that. <laughs> like calling malloc imagine. under malloc, because, you know, like if, if your setup process requires memory and your process is already allocated memory, then you're calling malloc under malloc and that is undefined behavior. Well, most of the time it's a crash. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine how tricky that stuff is, the memory right. stuff. All right, let's talk through some of the features. We've touched on a lot of these, but kind of just like got a great long list of amazing things that PyStack can do. Um, I'll, I'll just breeze over the ones we've talked about already, but then potentially uh, dive into the others. So it works on both running processes and it's one of the really unique aspects is on the core dump files, right? That's, right. that's very cool. And just, just to complete this part, it works on um, all core dump files, which is a huge, like if you are in the world of like how these things work, it's really hard because because core dumps don't have a specification. So this is very important. Like there is no document that will tell you how core dumps work. This is the first surprise that you will have if you try to search for it. So you will you will see how they normally work, but the, the amount of weird stuff that can happen is just countless. Like because yeah. because this is whatever the kernel is doing and whatever the version of the kernel is doing, so you can see super weird stuff. So and not just not just the kernel either. Uh, what Gcore does doesn't go through the kernel. So if you're using GDB to generate a core file, you might get something that's in an entirely different format than what the kernel would have dumped. And and the core files yeah. can miss data. So so it's, it's yeah. not really always a memory dump all the process like a complete one. Because for instance, imagine that you're in a system. Like, and you have like five Python applications, and then you generate a whole dump of the process. Well, those five Python applications are going to have loaded a lot of libraries that are common, like libc, uh, you know, OpenSSL. Um, so a bunch of these are libraries. Uh, so, so are you going to just include all of them? Well, technically you should, because that's what was loaded in the memory, but that's going to generate huge core files, like gigabytes in size. So a lot of the optimizations that are done is that, well, you know, if it's a cell library, just go and read the cell library. So I'm not going to include it, uh, which means that tools need to know that this is happening. And then when they see a pointer and they try to search in the core, they are going to find that there's nothing there. So they need to go to the library. So there is a lot of layers that you need to go. So the second part, when it says works on core and files, it's, it works on all of them, which is quite a, quite a huge statement. I guess we should touch on what platforms PyStack can run on. Just Linux. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all right. Just because, so. because it's, I mean, it could work. Uh, and this is an important fact. Like, for instance, if you're running on Windows or uh, macOS, you probably want to use the other tools like that we mentioned, like PySpy or Austin. I think both run on all platforms. Uh, but yes, uh, this is because we want to ensure that um, we do this very well and we cover all the cases and we have enough with one operative system. Um, our other tools work on, on macOS as well. So the profiler memory works on macOS. So we don't only do tools that work on Linux, but this one only works on Linux. Yeah. And, so and to be fair, it does also work on Windows in WSL. That is my main development environment. So if not natively on Windows, but at least if you're in a virtual machine on Windows, you're fine. PyStack will work on, on WSL? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well, yeah. yeah, OK, cool. And I suppose it works on Docker running yeah, Linux on a problem. bunch of machines, and like, like on you know parallels on Mac. And there's there's a lot mm -hmm. of ways on the yeah. different platforms. Yeah, I develop on Docker on Mac. So for instance, I run PyStack on Docker on Mac, no problem. And even okay. in the new ones, the M1 ones works nicely. Cool. 
Uh, let's see. What are some of the other ones here? Um, includes calls to inline functions in the native stack. Ah, that's a funny one. So, so one one of the things we do is that um, one 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 thing that can happen is that the the, the C compilers uh, they they really like to do this because it's very efficient. Uh, sometimes. Following some heuristics, they can say, "Well, you're calling this function, but this function is kind of small. So generating all the you know assembly code to prepare the call and fin finalize the call, plus all the locals and the stack and whatnot, is kind of very expensive. So what they do basically is copy paste the code in the caller. So so you know, and they set up everything so you know it works nicely." And the locals are not overwritten just because you use the name foo in both, right? So, so it kind of works. But the idea is that instead of calling a, fun a function, you just copy paste the code. But the, the 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 basically the effect that this has on the backtrace is that there is no function call, so there is no function. So when you are calling that function, it disappears. So it's like you never call it. And this can be quite confusing when you're looking at stack trace because if you have function b that calls function c and c calls d. And, and the middle one is in line, you're not going to see it, and then you're going to say A calling C. And you say, well, there's no way that happens because I'm not calling C here. Uh, so it, it, this can make this 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 kind of like backtraces very confusing. Right. Yeah. So This is in if, C, right. not in Python, right? Because Python doesn't have inlining. Exactly. Well, no, exactly. Python doesn't have inlining. That's true. We, we have something that we call inlining, but it's not the same thing. Uh, so we are, I'm not going to not explain that. Uh, compiler optimization type right, of thing. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah so, so, so there is no inlining in Python. That's correct. Let's let's just leave it like that. Uh, and But it's in C and C++ and Rust and whatnot. Um, so if there is debugging information, we can recover these inline calls, So which is something that, by the way, GDB can also do. Um, but um, but we can do it as well. So, um, so if there is enough of information. Nice. We we actually work in some cases when GDB doesn't, uh, just because GDB tries to be very correct in some of these cases. But uh, for whatever reason, is is over correct. Uh, we can actually do it most of the time. But yes, uh, this is a feature that that uh, we do. So you have one of these inline calls. Um, and we do more than that. So, for instance, if you have like uh, extreme debug information uh, that you can activate by passing, for instance, if you compile something with GCC, you can pass minus G3, that's uh, debug information level three. So, put everything there. We can even show you macros. So, you're using macros, which oh, wow. the macro expands to source basically, and then that source is passed to the compiler. So this, there is no macro at the at the compiler level. The compiler is going to see the source itself because the preprocessor kind of expand the macro. But but there is a technique in in the debugging information that can include the fact that there was a macro there. So we can show you the macro. We can say this was a macro. So and we can pretend that that was a function call. That, that's quite cool. That's crazy. Um, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. So when are we getting inlining of functions as an optimization in Python? Huh. Uh, probably not soon, <laughs> but uh, well, uh, to be honest, there is some interesting thing that are close. There is this pep uh, that was approved um, to inline uh, list comprehensions in in function calls. Yes, uh, right, right, I was right. about That's to say. Uh, but but you see, uh, as you can see, uh, what I said, the consequence is that you basically copy paste calls, so the function call disappears. Um, this will happen in Python, by the way. So when the pep is uh, implemented, which by the way it is implemented, if I recall correctly, um, what happens is that if you see a backtrace with PyStack, for instance, you are not going to see the least comprehension frame, which is fine because most of the time it doesn't add you anything because it's going to yeah. tell you here's a least comprehension and then you're calling a function yeah. called least comprehension. So it's kind of like weird, but. Um, the interesting parts of list comprehensions being function calls, basically. I mean, it's not really functions calls, is they have their own frame. But the interesting part here, which was one big change from Python 2 to Python 3, is that variables inside the comprehensions are local to the comprehension, which means that if you have a function, a variable called x outside, and then you use a variable called x inside, and you assign to that by using the comprehension name, the one outside is not modified. Right. This is maintained here, even if it's in line, because you know, even if it's in line, that is maintained. But there is some cases when that behavior is very, very tricky, particularly class scopes. So you have a comprehension in a class scope, which already is something weird to do, but you can absolutely do it. Like class scopes are quite wild. They are not. They they they, they don't behave like function scopes. Um, so there is there, there was a bunch of edge edge cases that we saw. Uh, so this comprehension in inlining is deactivated on class scopes, for instance, just because there was some consequences of the inlining. Uh, there is some in the discussion of the pep. There is the case if you want to see it here. Explaining this here it will be a bit weird, but 
but it's quite important because inlining always has consequences. Um, yeah. One of them is the, the frame is missing, but this frame is not going to be missed by anyone because it doesn't really add anything. All right, so we, we sort of have them. L one of the things I think is really cool about asking for information here and it's just really helpful, M maybe beyond even like a good log message and stuff is not only do you see the stack trace, uh, the call stack here when you, you know, this line in this file called this function and so on, but you can see optionally the local variables, right? Yes. And what's, what's extremely interesting about that is that you would normally need to call like the dunder repr method of an object in order to figure out how to print it out in a user-friendly way, but we can't do that, right? We're working on crash processes. We're reading one byte of memory at a time to try to interpret it. So in order to give you these locals, PyStack needs to be able to understand the C Python representation of a list and know how to iterate over a list manually to figure out what elements it contains and recursively turn, recursively get the repr for each of those method or for each of those objects that are in the collection as well it can't just rely on being able to call python code to get you this string right and manually here means that it needs to know that at least in python release a bunch of pointers that points to a buffer and the buffer is a bunch of py objects and then every object can be different so obviously this means that we cannot print all objects so if you have a custom object we cannot print that we we will print something we will tell you for instance the name of the class or we will say um, we will almost act like if there is no report, so we will say um, custom object instance at location blah blah blah. So the default report that you will get if you create a class. Um, but for most of the common types, dictionary, dictionary sets, integral floats, etc., we functions, all of these things, we we actually are able to print it. Um, again, here the idea is adding debugging, like help, help you debug these things. So obviously it's not going to be the same as you know having having a debugger attached to something that you can inspect, but but most of the time that you you don't really need it because most of the time if you need to know the locals is because you have a function call and the function call has a, a specific argument that are passed to the function and it modifies how the function behaves. Like for instance, imagine that it has a keyword argument and the keyword argument is strict or replace like the Unicode re, um, encode. Um, call. So you you really want to know if you pass one or the other because otherwise it's going to trigger different call paths. Uh, so that, that, in that if you use this this um, that's this locals option in Python that you will see what arguments were passed to the functions and also the local variables in the functions. And if most of the time it's just this you know built-in types like lists or things like that, um, then it's going to be very useful uh, and it's going to be mostly enough. I think. I mean, let's be, it's kind of weird that between the authors we said this because obviously we're going to say nice things, but I swear it's true. Every time I particularly myself needed this option, uh, the, the things that we were printing were the things that I needed to know. So I didn't really need to know, you know, because you will say, well, if I have a NumPy array, I won't see the, the, the array, right? You will show me NumPy array. Well, sure, but that won't help you debug the, the, a crashing code because it doesn't really matter what is in the NumPy array. Um, it's also fair to point out that if someone ever finds like a built-in type that they needed to know the value of in order to debug a problem, they can bring it to us and we can see if we can implement it. The benefits of open source. Yeah, two thoughts uh, sort of came up for me when I was listening to all describe that. And this is just such a cool feature. One, you know, if it's a class, a custom object that does not have slots, you could grab just the dunder dict and kind of print it as a dict. Would be one like if you. Yes, but no. Uh, the, this is a very interesting question. Actually, you ask. Um, for instance, in Python three twelve, there is an optimization in which there is no dunder dict. Um, so, so, so <laughs> this is quite funny, actually. Um, it's quite funny because what happens is that this is one of the optimizations of the faster C Python project. This I think was done by Inada San and Mark Shannon. Um, so the idea here is that uh, if you think about it, if you have an object that has a under dict, right, and, and it has a hash table, unless you want the dictionary itself and wants to just say, here is a dictionary, I can just, you know, take a photo and put it in a poster in my room because I like it. Uh, unless you want the dictionary as itself, you normally we, want... Should we maybe take a second to explain what dict is? 
All right. Um, so, so most objects in Python, uh, like mm -hmm. you have a class, uh, like my class uh, animal, an animal has a bunch of attributes like name an age and like, you know, uh, kind of animal or whatever. Uh, so in Python, those attributes are internally represented with a hash table, which in Python we call a dictionary. And you can ask, ask the Python interpreter to show you that internal dictionary. So normally you will say myanimal.name that will print uh, Bimo, which is the name of my cat. Um, but uh, you you not uh, you can actually ask for that hash table that is internally, and for that you will need to know my animal dot dig so underscore underscore dig underscore underscore, and that will give you the internal hash table with the name of all the attributes that you have. So it will show name, kind, age as a strings, and they will show you the actual values. So that's normally how Python is represented internally. And when you do attribute access internally, it goes to this hash table in different ways and fetches this arm, right? But in Python 3.12, we said, well, among other things, because this optimization touches many things, really having a hash table represented with a full dictionary is a bit expensive. Because if you think about it, uh, if you access an attribute, having the full hash table is not really needed. Among other things, because the hash table has a bunch of like uh, things that allow it to work as a Python object, but you don't really enjoy those things. Like for instance, it has a, a pointer to the class and it's telling you, I'm a dictionary, but you already know that it's a dictionary because that's what we put there. So having the yeah. whole full dictionary with reference counts and all that stuff as a normal Python object is expensive memory wise, but also forces you to have um, a bunch of indirections. And we already have a bunch of optimizations here. For instance, one of the optimizations that we had is that if you have a class, let's say animal again, most of the instances of the class, if not all, are going to have the same attributes because normally you, all animals, of, all cats have name, age, and whatever, right? Uh, you absolutely can add new attributes. So, so this is something that you can, but normally you don't. So what we do is that instead, instead of like storing the same names in the, dictionary of every instance, we put those names in the class because they are going to be common. And then if you add kind of like extra extra attributes, we kind of add it to the dictionary after the fact. But there is already, the diction that dictionary is already weird. Like in the sense that sometimes the, the, the keys are outside the dictionary just because they are shared. This is the shared key dictionary optimization. Uh, so we went a, a step ahead and we just eliminated the dictionary. So now what we have is the internals of the hash table, like let's say row. So there is no Python object kind of wrap it around it. It's kind of like just raw pointers. And if only if you ask for that dunder digs and you want you say, well, I don't care about your optimization, just give me the hash table. Because code that does that still needs to see the hash table. You, we cannot break that. So only right. when you ask for the dictionary, we plop, we instantiate that dictionary and then we give it to you. So so before calling dunder dig was just getting a pointer and that's it. Here's the dictionary. Now, calling under the compute stuff, like it just it just creates a dictionary on the fly and gives it to you. Which means, uh, by the way, this is a nice piece of trivia. Uh, before, if you want to uh, calculate the approximate, because this is always approximate, there is no full way to say how big is my Python object and everything it contains, because Python objects are a graph, and that's it. that question most, most of the time doesn't make sense. For instance, Python objects point to their module, and you don't want to also include the, the, the module in the size, right? Among other things. But if you want to know the size of, um, you know, a, a custom object, you normally says size of the instance plus size of the dict. But now in Python 3.12, just by asking for the size of the dict by doing my instance yeah. under dict, you just make it bigger. <laughs> so the, the the real size of the object was actually smaller than you will what you will get. Um, I think that sounds like a great optimization, but it does make your life harder uh, here. The it other thought that I had is... Well, I mean, it's not really like harder, uh, among other things, because we know already how to print dictionaries, so that's fine. We, we, if it's a dictionary, we print dictionaries, and if it's not a dictionary, we are already in the business of in inspecting internal structures, and we know absolutely how to interpret parts of hash tables, yeah. and at the end of the day, what we have here is parts of hash tables for now. The problem here is more about, like, what happens if it changes in the future? Because right now, for instance, it's easy, but like, you know, as we optimize more and more in, in the next release, it, it's, it's not going to be easy. And right now we can say, well, we support this, this, that, and this other thing. And we means that every time a new Python version is published, we need to just go to all those things and check if they were changed and then change our code, which is quite a lot of work. Um, but if we support more types, it means that we need to do this thing for more things. And sometimes yeah. it's, it's harder, right? Especially custom uh, yeah. objects. Who knows what we find there? So, so we kind of like 
stay away from that because you know it's maybe a lot of work <laughs> you're already busy eh? like we right. established all right uh let me just flip through here and see if there's anything else that we would have covered i feel like that's that's pretty much it maybe just um one more well, shout uh, out to the PyTest plugin and whatever else you'll think we should well one, one last thing i think is interesting here just to highlight um which is kind of cool is that we um in both our tools, so PyStack and Debugger, and this kind of links into the conversation that we had before around the UX and how we put a lot of emphasis on UX and making these tools super easy. So for instance, as we mentioned before, uh, and we were talking about some of these features, and then I say, for instance, the inline, right? We said, well, if you have the bug information, we do this. But as I said before at the beginning of the podcast, uh, I said most of the things don't have the right information. So most people will say, well, then like, what is this point of this, right? So, but then we said, okay, so we, we really want to make this thing easy. So we don't want to tell people, well, if you want to use this feature, then you need to install this thing and just find your distribution, how to, yada, yada, yada. it's kind of annoying, right? So one of the things we leverage in both our tools in PyStack and Membrane is this thing that Matt mentioned before, this debugging for the server. So this means that in most distributions, the most modern distributions, so this means that the latest versions of Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, Arc Linux, it works on most most of the new ones. Um, there is there is a way that the debugging tools can say, okay, I have here a, a binary, like let's say Python, and this binary doesn't have the right information, but I really need it. So can you give me the debug information? And it will download it automatically for you, so you don't need to do anything. The tool will do it for you, so it will figure it out what debug information it needs from the process it's analyzing. It will go to the distribution. It will say, hey, can you give me the debug information for this, 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 and this? It will download it for you. It will automatically merge it to the binary, and it will use it for showing the inlines or the C code or whatever it is. This means that most of the time, what you will see is that the first time you analyze a Python process, it will take a bit more time just because it's downloading these files, and these files can be a bit big. It will tell you that it's doing it. But, um, and then it will, it will the, these files then are cache for subsequent calls, so you don't download them every single time. But then uh, it just works by magic. So you have this this kind of process that have the information, and voila, it just works. So you don't need to do anything. You don't need to know about the fact that you needed the bug information or the fact that your Python is optimized and doesn't have anything. You, you just work. Uh, it just works. Uh, so you just need a new enough distribution. And even if you don't have a new enough distributions, there is a way to set up in the old ones. But anyway, if you're using one of the latest supported Ubuntu, Debian, Arc, Fedora, Red Hat, all of these have it, uh, then magically it will just work, which is something that we really, really um, are happy about because it means that you, know, you don't need to know about all of these things. You, you will just get it. That's really fantastic. You can go out and grab it and just right. get it for you without you worrying about it. It feels problem. magical. Like uh, the first time I saw it, I, I need this. Like this is just the future. Like this is the future because if you have to do this manually, it just makes you miserable. And I know how to do it. And I know how you need to do it, and it still makes me miserable. So I, I don't want to do it. I just I just want the tool to figure it out. And and this these both tools do it. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. All right, guys, I think we're out of time here. But you know, final thoughts. People are excited about PyStack. Uh, what Matt? What would you tell them? Go ahead, check Try it out. How would they use it? Yeah. Yeah. Try it out, download it. Um, it's as easy as pip install PyStack. Find something that isn't working the way you expect it to, point PyStack at it, and see if you can figure it out. And of course, we're open to contributions. So if you find uh, especially issues, if you find something that's broken, let us know. Uh, if you find some platform it doesn't work on, let us know. But yeah, uh, it is my single go-to debugging tool whenever something gets stuck or doesn't do what I'm expecting it to do. When I run a Python command at a command prompt and it just doesn't return, uh, I reach for this all the time. I'm convinced it's a very useful tool for people. Yeah, it looks amazing. Pablo, final thoughts? Yeah, the only thing I will add to what Matt said is that one of the things, um, in general, don't do only this thing for PyStack and, and our tools, do it for every tool that you use, is that giving um, you know, success stories. So when you use the tool in that particular challenging situation and it really works and you, know, you just say, wow, it just works. Um, just just go to the to the repo again. Not only us, but any any tool that you see that actually does this, and tell the maintainers what you were trying to do, and that you were really happy. Uh, among other things, 
uh, these really helps maintainers because at the end of the day, you think about it, we are putting all this work and then we just get the, the case that really doesn't work. So it's a bit <laughs> discouraging. Uh, so it will keep us happy and that's kind of important in open source since these things are free. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it allows us to know how people are using the tool. Uh, so when we discuss new features and like how we evolve the tool, we, we know um, how to do that. So for instance, for memory, we have this success stories page uh, where you have, uh, we are going to have the same as in Biostack. So if you, if you just happen to use it and you like it or you use it successfully to fix something, just tell us. We are super happy to learn from you and, and to know uh, what, why it was useful to you and what kind of features you used from the tool uh, so we can keep improving it. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's a really great idea. I encourage people to do that as well. So Pablo, Matt, thanks for being on the show. Always a pleasure, Michael. Thanks yeah. for having us.